I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story, where I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the applied science and bewitchery of brand and business storytelling, so that you can clarify your story to amplify your impact and simplify your life. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. You know, in the 15 plus years that I've been a student of and been teaching about storytelling in business and brands, I've found that the thing about storytelling is it really brings two worlds together, that of the tellers and of the audience. In fact, I call storytelling the Velcro of collaboration because it helps you understand one another, develop empathy for each other, and find a common ground that can help move the journey forward. But it's not always easy. We live in a divided world, and that division is just natural. It starts within us, actually, as we constantly wrestle with our divided internal selves, telling ourselves stories in our conscious mind while our subconscious is often acting from a completely different script, and we don't even realize we're doing it. Jonathan Haidt is an American social psychologist, and he used the metaphor of the writer and the elephant in his 2006 book, The Happiness Hypothesis, Finding Modern Truth in Ancient Wisdom. He explored the relationship between ancient philosophies such as Stoicism and Buddhism and modern science, and explained that our subconscious is like the big, lumbering, emotional elephant that has a mind all of its own while our conscious mind is the little writer sitting on top trying to rationally steer this mental pachyderm in the direction we want it to go. You see, we often are trying to bridge the divide in our minds by the stories we tell ourselves. In a second book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, it came out in 2012, Haidt explored external divisions. He examined how morality is shaped by emotion and intuition, again, the elephant, more than by reasoning, that little writer up top, and why differing political groups such as progressives, conservatives, libertarians have such different notions of what's right and wrong, even as we all want the same things in life. So from this book came a thought that I have leaned on more and more in my storytelling training. Height wrote, the human mind is a story processor, not a logic processor. It's the foundation from which I argue against mind-numbing PowerPoints that chloroform conference rooms and for turning your data into drama using stories, tales, anecdotes, and allegories to connect with people, especially those with dramatically differing views than yours, to find common ground and move our collective elephant parade forward. You can argue with data all day long, but it's difficult to dispel the truth from a well-told real-world story. In his new book, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure, Haidt with his co-author Greg Lukanoff, the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, reveal how we can overcome the polarization that is happening now on our university campuses. They call out studies and show that iGen, or the Gen Zers, those are the kids that are born in 1995 and after, this whole new sentiment that they are bringing to campuses. They are the first generation raised on screens and social media, and it is impacting the way they are socializing around the universities. They are calling out professors in unprecedented ridicule in ways that is just kind of mind-boggling. They are blocking controversial speakers coming to campus, and they are even at odds with what is being taught. 
Well, Haidt and Lukanoff had attracted both support and criticism for their critique of the current state of universities and their interpretation of progressive values. But it's absolutely fascinating what they've uncovered. If you want to hear cliff notes to the coddling of the American mind, just listen to Jonathan on The Joe Rogan Show, episode 1221. That's episode 1221. It aired a couple weeks ago, and it is just mind-boggling to give you the insight of what's happening. Haidt has been named one of the top global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine and one of the top world thinkers by Prospect Magazine. He is among the most cited researchers in political psychology, moral psychology, and has given four TED Talks. He is currently the professor of ethical leadership at New York University's Stern School of Business, focused on the psychology of morality and the moral emotions. So, how do we bridge these internal and external gaps with the stories we tell ourselves and others? Well, let's explore that right now with Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Honored to have you here. Well, thank you, Park. Pleasure to be here with you. You know, I have been a big fan for a long time reading The Happiness Hypothesis, which I think I learned first about you through Dan and Chip Heath's book, Switch, How to Make Change When Change is Difficult. I think that was the book where they first started talking about your rider and elephant metaphor. That's right. They called me up one day. I've known uh, Chip Heath for a long time. We're fellow social psychologists. And he said, John, I I love love your metaphor, the rider and the elephant. The idea that the mind's divided into parts that sometimes conflict, like a rider, meaning conscious reasoning, and uh, the elephant, meaning the other 99% of what goes on in our minds, the automatic and intuitive and emotional processes. And he said, uh, John, is it okay if me and my brother use that metaphor in our book? And I said, take my metaphor, please, Uh, because I knew that he's he's a great writer. He was going to reach a much bigger audience. And so, yeah, a lot of people know about me only because they read uh, uh, Chip and Dan's book, Switch. Well, I, when I went to research you after reading that, I remember the cover of the happiness hypothesis of an elephant swimming. And I thought that was really interesting. And that really sucked me in. And I enjoyed that book tremendously. Of course, then you went on to write The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And then a book I just literally finished last night, The Coddling of the American Mind. And in all of these, the theme that at least that I've pulled away from your work that resonates with me is how you help us connect our worlds, both our internal worlds of that happiness hypothesis and how do we really find happiness within. So connecting our worlds internally to the separation that you demonstrate in the righteous mind of both how how polarized we are in this world and the six uh, foundational moral foundations that you talk about in that book to where we are today in academia, especially in universities, which seems in a lot of cases because of the I generation coming up, this is the group behind uh, the millennials or next up from the millennials and how this uh, polarization divisiveness is getting even stronger in some areas. So on today's show, love to pull from your wisdom out of moral psychology and all of your work on how do we bring our worlds together? How do we make that happen? Because in one of your talks, I did note that you were saying, you know, we are actually living in one of the best times ever for humanity. There's more prosperity around the world. Health is going up around the world. And while we still have, you know, populations that are at risk, that we are in a pretty good time. And yet, with all the polarization, the nationalization going on, it feels like, as Dickens might say, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. Mm-hmm. How do we start bridging those worlds through this idea of story and st- connecting people with our stories? Yes, that is what we should talk about today. I'll start with some, some preliminary remarks, which is, um, while I'm fairly pessimistic about the future of America, I think some really bad things could happen as we, as we come apart. Um, uh, let me say right up front that I am a big fan of Steve Pinker, uh, whose books, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now, make the case very strongly that uh, people in many ages have thought things were going to hell, things were getting worse, and they weren't. uh, And that if you look at the material conditions of humanity now, they are astonishingly good compared to when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s. We thought, you know, poverty, starvation, hunger, hundreds of millions of people will die from starvation and overpopulation. None of those came true. In fact, last year, uh, poverty has dropped so far and so fast in the last few decades that uh, it was announced earlier this year, last year in 2018, 
that for the first time in human history, a majority of human beings are now in the middle class. Uh, and it was announced two or three years ago that for the first time in human history, less than 10% of human beings are living in extreme poverty. So there are many reasons to be optimistic. Technology gets better and better. Diseases are being vanquished. But you know, as Sigmund Freud observed a long time ago, the sources of misery come from various places. And as we eliminate sources of misery from the physical world, we tend to somehow make up for it by, uh, in our social lives by making each other more miserable. Uh, there seems to be some conservation of misery. Now, uh, that may you be mean we're looking it. for misery. <laughs> well, um, there are ways in which as we, uh, as we get more prosperous, there are what are called problems of prosperity. And we'll get into that with the coddling the American mind. As we really have made life safer, uh, and better in most ways. In some ways, we then adjust down the level of what is tolerable. And for some young people today, Gen Z or iGen, they have multiple names, um, they, they find certain things painful or intolerable, you know, overhearing jokes that are offensive. They find some things painful. They even talk about them as being dangerous. So standards do shift. This is a roundabout way of saying that many things are getting better objectively. But I think in our conversation today, we're going to talk about some perhaps unanticipated consequences of linking everyone together and basically unanticipated consequences of, of mass prosperity, namely moral incoherence and chaos. So one of the things that we've really been experiencing, at, at least in my household, my wife, Michelle, is an ardent viewer of CNN, and she's certainly um, on the far left. I mean, she's very liberal. Um, and she often asks me, why do they think that way? Why, yeah. how can the Republicans get behind, you know, Trump? And how can this be? And I can sit there and, you know, quite often say the same thing. Why? Why can't they see it our way or my way or what way? What is it that divides us? Because I believe that on both ends of this, you know, the polarity is we're all in this for the right reasons, for prosperity and safety and opportunity for our family members. We just approach it from completely different ways. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let me start with my, my favorite quote from the social sciences. It's from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz, but he's paraphrasing uh, the great sociologist Max Weber. And he says, man is an animal suspended in webs of significance that he himself has spun. Uh, what that means is that the world that we live in isn't just made of, you know, rocks and trees or, or plaster and, and steel and glass. The world we live in is a world of norms and, and values and expectations and traditions and understandings. And you certainly can see this if you study anthropology, you read ethnographies, you read about small-scale societies that believe that saying certain words together will kill you or, or that there are taboos on certain foods. Um, people make meanings. They, they create a world and then they live in that world. Now, when there is one dominant culture um, one general orientation. It's almost like the Pax Romana. Uh, in the mid-20th century, uh, the world that I was growing up in, I'm, I'm Jewish, uh, and I grew up in a world that was largely structured by the, by the WASP consensus of the 20th century. And it was a world in which the Jews did fantastically well. And, and my parents taught me to love and respect America and be so grateful that my grandparents came here. Um, and my, my, wife's, my wife is Korean-American, uh, her, her family, a similar story, just a generation later. Um, so there was a kind of a, a dominant overarching narrative. When I was a kid, we had books like, uh, you know, uh, J what is it, uh, Dick and Jane and Tip and Mitten, presenting sort of the idealized, uh, uh, you know, uh, wasp family. Um, and so it, there was a, a dominant story about who we were and what our values were. And it was pretty tolerant because, you know, Jews and Koreans could each have their own communities and believe what they wanted and eat what they wanted. Um, and gradually that fell apart. Um, we did have a period in the 20th century of very low immigration. America is a country of immigrants. But from the 1920s, you know, there, there, there were, in a sense, too many immigrants when my grandparents came. It kind of overwhelmed a lot of systems. It provoked a backlash. It provoked a locking of the doors in the 1920s. And for several decades, uh, America did have declining diversity and a rising sense of coherence and who we were. And I think this was at least related to our dominance of the 20th century. We had the benefits of diversity while still having an overarching narrative. And now what I think has happened for a lot of reasons, that overarching narrative has fallen apart. There is no overarching narrative. Um, America's coming apart into different communities that live in really 
different worlds. Left and right, beginning in the 1990s, left and right now have a different U.S. constitution. I mean, the constitution that governs progressives is just not at all the same document as the one that governs conservatives. We have different climate science, different history books, um, different economics, uh, different beliefs about the minimum wage and the facts about what will happen if you raise it. So um, a central idea in The Righteous Mind is that we form these, these moral matrix, morality binds and blinds, and left and right, aided by technology and, and originally with cable news, we can segregate into different worlds, build up our separate moral worlds. Unfortunately, we have to live next to each other and we have to interact with each other and we can't stand that. Um, so that's, that's part of why we're in such a state of incoherence and, and, and turmoil now. We live in different moral worlds that over, overlap physically and it's very difficult. And when you talk about a moral world, a lot of time people's brains go to, oh, is he, you know, is it like a Christianity, you know, morality that you're you're talking about that we have to be good, clean, kind, and whatever? Or when you're talking about these moral foundations, what are they, and how would you define them? Mm-hmm. Uh, so when I talk about moral matrices or moral worlds, um, well, sure, there, you know, there are evangelical Christians that live in a world in America um, that is very Bible centric. But in my world on campus, I never, ever hear a reference to Christianity or Christ or Jesus or the Bible. I mean, we never talk about that. Um, there are some subsets in which it's just obvious that America is a matrix of oppression. It's, uh, it is and has always been racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, everything. That's one moral world popular on the left. Uh, there are different moral worlds popular on the right. So I think my contribution to this is to, is to break it down and look at what are the building blocks of morality? Um, what do human beings all around the world, what do they build these moral worlds out of? Because they're not arbitrary. You can't just make up a moral world to be anything you want and then expect real human beings to live in it. The communists tried to do that. Many utopian societies have tried to do that. Hey, let's build a world in which from each according to his ability to each according to his need, it'll be great. And that never, ever works. That can work in a a family. It can work on a very small scale, but it can never, ever work for a country. Um, And there are myths. There are there there are are, are impossible worlds on the on the right as well. I don't want to just pick on the left. Um, So you can't just make up anything. And the reason is because the human mind evolved, just like our hands evolved originally to grip tree limbs, and then our ancestors came down from the trees, and we developed more more generally useful hands. And our brains evolved, but our brains evolved for the kinds of societies that we've lived in for hundreds of thousands or, in a sense, millions of years, if you go back um, to pre-human and even early mammal days. So the the six major foundations of morality that I and my colleagues have studied are as follows. Care, fairness, liberty, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. You can think of these as being like the six taste buds of the moral mind. All of our tongues have five taste receptors on them, sweet, sour, salt, bitter, and umami, or MSG, a kind of a a detector for substances in meat. The reason is because we evolved from fructivores, so primates are fructivores, we love fruit, so our tongues are specialized for finding ripe fruit, which is sweet, versus unripe fruit, which is sour or bitter. And for finding meat, uh, we're also descended from scavengers and carnivores. So our tongues guide us to the kinds of foods that were good for our ancestors, and our moral foundations, our moral sentiments, guide us to the kind of social relationships that were good for our ancestors. Care, we're mammals. We we have to be sensitive to the suffering of helpless, cute infants with large heads and large eyes and small bodies. That's what our babies look like. So we could do this analysis for each of the foundations, but you know, we think there's a very strong case uh, that human morality, while it looks different around the world, is always composed of those six elements. There are others, those are not the only six, but care, fairness, liberty, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. You find evidence of those in every society. So you've got these four moral foundations and the left and the right view them differently or they come about them differently. And in some cases, as I, well, in all cases, I guess I read in The Righteous Mind is where the right, the Republican Party and so forth will come at their world through all six of these foundations while the left really is more interested in care, fairness and loyalty. Is that right? And how does that play out to create this greater divide? 
That's right. Uh, care, fairness, and liberty are the ones on the left, but it's especially care. So everybody has all six. Everybody can respond. What you have to realize is that collectively we, we tell stories that may not be stories that any one of us individually are telling. So I have a paper, uh, given you the, you, the interest of you and your listeners in stories, I have a paper if people Google this, they'll find it. Above and below left, right, ideological narratives and moral foundations. Um, and my co-authors and I, uh, Jesse Graham and, and Craig Joseph, we go through how there's three levels of personality. Uh, there's the sort of the lowest level, like things like the big five. Are you extroverted? Are you neurotic? Uh, are you high on openness to experience? Those are really low-level personality traits that are largely heritable and that don't really change. Uh, then there's a second level, which is called characteristic adaptations. Uh, so if you are the youngest in a family, you may learn to use um, humor to get your way because you can't use force. But if you're the oldest in the family, you may be a little bit more dominant. You learn ways of coping with your situation in life. Um, but uh, there's a third level, uh, and here we're drawing on personality psychologist Dan McAdams, of um, personal narratives. that you, People come to tell a story about their own life. Uh, it may or may not be true, but people come to understand their own lives in a narrative fashion. Uh, McAdams calls them integrative life stories. Um, I'll just read this here from the paper. Level three, this highest level, centrally concerns identity, and more specifically, identity as experienced in a narrative mode. At this level, we would examine the stories people tell themselves and others about how they came to hold the moral and political beliefs they currently hold. We would not expect these stories to be literally true as historical accounts, but we would expect them to influence a person's behavior, including political behavior, such as voting and involvement in political movements. So that's how you might understand an individual at three levels. And what we say in this paper is we talk about how um, if you are attracted to the left or the right, perhaps because of your heritable personality, if you tend to like order and neatness and predictability, you'll be more receptive to right-leaning causes. If you tend to like variety and diversity and, and you're a little lower on conscientiousness but higher on spontaneity, you'll be more likely to be attracted to left-leaning causes. But once you join a group, this group buys into a narrative that they themselves did not write. So Ronald Reagan was so brilliant uh, as a storyteller. He told a story about America that brought together some groups that are very different psychologically and in terms of their interests. Uh, the Christian conservatives who, who wanted a story with sanctity and, and uh, uh, biblical themes. The business conservatives who are extremely different and secular, but who believe strongly in a free market. Uh, and the more authoritarian elements, the, the people who are threatened by certain kinds of diversity and, and, and really, really want to build, build walls. So Ronald Reagan, as a storyteller, was able to tell a story about America at a time when Americans were in moral chaos and, and doubt in the 1970s that, united, that created the modern Republican coalition. That coalition is now fracturing. Donald Trump is not a conservative. He's not a storyteller. Um, and he is emphasizing the authoritarian sub-element sub of that coalition. Um, but yes, that's basically how mm -hmm. I think it works. And you, you don't think that Donald Trump is a storyteller? Is he a storyteller? It um, seems to me like he's one of the most powerful storytellers maybe to ever be in office. He, oh, good. Okay, good. Let's talk about that. Yeah. He clearly tells stories about himself. He, I, he um, thinks very highly of himself. Many of my uh, clinical psychologist friends say that he has narcissistic personality disorder. So he does tell a story about himself um, frequently. What is the story he tells about America? Well, we're going to make America great again. Of course, he borrowed that directly from Reagan. But he tells, I don't know, lots of stories about, you know, you can't trust an immigrant. Seems to be a narrative that he often talks about. Well, and then we'll fabricate really, stories. Yeah. Well, those aren't really stories about America. He will occasionally tell like one or two sentence stories, you know, about an illegal immigrant came here and killed somebody. Mm -hmm. Those are not stories about America. I, I don't see a story about America. I see what you're saying. You know, a more of an overall rapturing type of, of narrative like Reagan did that says, look, at we can do this together and bring people back together to make America well, great. So, yeah, a, a story, a political narrative um, has to have or should have a once upon a time. Uh, once upon a time, America was like this. This is who we really are. This is our origin. And then along came some problem. 
maybe it's a group of people, maybe it was a political crisis, maybe it was an external enemy. There was this problem. Uh, and it had us on the ropes for a while, but we fought back and here we are, and this is what we need to do to achieve, to achieve victory or, or to, uh, to become who we really were meant to be or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Barack Obama was a very good storyteller and, and he was very good for a Democrat, especially he was very good at reaching back to the founding fathers and quoting our founding texts. He was very eloquent and, and, and able to move people. He was a great orator. So in, in my life, I've been lucky to have had three great orators and as president, uh, Ronald Reagan, whom I hated at the time, but I have a lot more respect for now. Um, Bill Clinton, um, who, again, extremely eloquent and a good storyteller, uh, and Barack Obama. Uh, but George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, and uh, Donald Trump, I think, don't touch our hearts in that way. Now, Trump certainly does touch emotions. I mean, he, he, ha there, he has some intuitive gift for connecting with emotions, but I don't think he tells a coherent story about America. Yeah, I've had Dr. Randy Olson on uh, several times, and he talks about the and button, therefore construct, and how Ray, or, uh, Trump uses it very well. It's a setup of America used to be a great and mighty nation, then the but, or the complication, but America is no longer great. Now, he never really goes in and explains that other than he says everyone's laughing at us, um, therefore, I'm going to make America great again. And he seems to use a set of problem resolution in a lot of the stuff. But I see what you're saying that he doesn't talk about it in, in, a, in a larger, more expansive way that calls on the past and helps propel us to the future. It's more like, uh, well, what of the moral foundations that you talk about in the righteous mind, do you feel like he plays off of the most yeah. to rile up his base? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Uh, I would agree that there are proto story elements. He does make it seem as though we were once great, maybe in the fifties and sixties and when we were the dominant power. And then we have fallen recently um, because of the liberals, because of political correctness uh, and immigration. So I guess you're right that there are, there are elements there. If one is looking for a story, there are elements there, but he doesn't weave them together uh, in, in an eloquent or, or, or cohesive way. Mm -hmm. The moral foundations that he, that he prays upon, I'm sorry, builds upon. Um, so <laughs> care, not at all. He, he, there's nothing uh, in him about compassion, uh, care for the vulnerable, the suffering. Uh, and of course, the, the incidents at the border show a complete, I mean, you could not ask for a more direct negation of, of care concerns than putting kids in cages. So care, he's zero. Um, fairness, he's really, really big. Uh, that is, fairness has two different forms. One is uh, equality, which tends to, uh, which is what people on the left tend to focus on. The other is proportionality. The idea that people are getting away with something. Uh, if you do the crime, do the time. You know, the Chinese are getting away with murder. And, you know, he actually is right on some of those things. I mean, there were a lot of, a lot of hypocrisy and, and we put up with the Chinese have behaved terribly, according to economists on the right and the left. Um, their rise was fueled by intellectual property theft and, and taking advantage. So, you know, I think Trump is right on, on, on a few of these points. But a lot of it is the sense that we're being cheated, we're being gypped. So that is absolutely, he, he just locks right into the Fairness Foundation and, and, and punches it and punches it and punches it. And that's about uh, pro proportionality, correct? That's yeah, that's right. We're, we're being, being ripped yeah. off. That's yeah. right. We're being mm -hmm. ripped off. So that is a moral concern. That is absolutely moral, a moral foundation. The third uh, moral foundation is liberty. Um, he doesn't talk much about that. He doesn't talk much about uh, America as a shining beacon of freedom. Um, most Republican and Democratic presidents have talked about freedom, liberty a lot. He doesn't do much of that. Loyalty, he does. Boy, does he talk about loyalty. Um, and the idea of, uh, you know, we're going to punish our enemies and uh, now, of course, you know, the funny thing there is that he is very good at insulting America's allies and praising our enemies. So uh, he's it's complicated here, but his rhetoric does involve ideas about loyalty. You can see this even in how he spoke to um, FBI Director Comey, mm -hmm. um, you know, that you, you will be loyal to me, right? Um, he, he has a kind of a mafia sense of, of, of group loyalty or, or, or loyalty to a patron. Um, so that is part of his moral world, loyalty. Um, and then the, those are authority. Uh, now, authority he's big on. That especially is the idea of order versus chaos. And his uh, acceptance speech at the, at the Republican National Convention was modeled directly on Richard Nixon's in 1968. 
uh, I think it was, was it Paul Manafort, one of his campaign advisors, basically said so, it wasn't Manafort, somebody else, said so that we looked back and we looked at Nixon's acceptance speech. Now, 1968, you know, the cities were on fire. There were riots. There was chaos, drugs, protests. Um, uh, and Nixon comes in and makes the authoritarian appeal, which is, I will restore order. Um, I stand for you. And that's what populists always do is to say, uh, I speak directly to you and for you, the, 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 the individual American people against those elites. Um, and so uh, uh, Trump came in with the authoritarian populist uh, appeal about he, he, I alone can fix it. I will restore order. And then the last one is sanctity, which is a funny one. Um, the idea that something is sacred, uh, untouchable, um, perfectly good and pure, must not be degraded. And many past presidents have talked about democracy or America in, in such terms. We speak with reverence of the founding documents, uh, the, the Constitution. Trump is, is odd on this. He doesn't speak. He's not an eloquent man. Um, he doesn't act like anything is really sacred. He himself is very high on disgust. And disgust is the emotion that undergirds our sense of sacredness and, and, and resistance to contamination. Um, he washes his hands a lot, doesn't like to shake hands or touch people. So there's something funny going on with him about disgust, contamination, purity, sanctity. And I, I haven't fully figured out what it is. So where he's big and not so big in some of these moral foundations, how do you see that connecting to the right, to his base over there? And I guess it really creates disgust then on the left because they look at this and how he goes about it and they are disgusted, certainly. Yes. And you saw that in the midterm elections. That's right. So uh, Trump is extremely good at, um, d at saying and doing the, the most powerful things to anger people on the left. Now, a key idea we need to bring in here from political science is that we now are in a state known as negative partisanship. So research uh, political scientist Shanto Iyengar, I-Y-E-N-G-A-R, has a few papers on this. Until around 2000, I think it was, American democracy worked like this. A candidate would stake out a position, make speeches, have, you know, hold, out, uh, hold forth positions, and, and, and you, you would vote for the candidate that you liked. Um, we voted for candidates. Uh, beginning around 2000 or 2004, we switched over to it being more accurate to say we voted against the candidate we hated the most. We had negative partisanship. And so this propelled Trump to victory in 2016 because he was very good at attacking the left, at attacking Hillary. And if you vote for someone for negative reasons, they don't have to deliver on their promises. They just have to be very good at punching the people you hate in the nose. And Trump is very good at that. So the, so the right had a lot of passion. There was a lot of dissatisfaction with the present state of things economically, the slow growth of wages for the bottom half or two thirds. Um, Hillary Clinton herself was very good at alienating people, especially with her basket of deplorable statement. Uh, she just was not personally very likable, not very eloquent. Um, and she really was into playing identity politics and making clear that she was the candidate for all the oppressed groups, not for, not for white men. Um, so there was a lot a lot of people disliked her. And even a lot of people on the left had very little passion for her. So negative partisanship helped Trump win just by attacking the left. But I don't think that's going to help him this time around because now uh, he is the president and the Republicans have controlled everything for the last two years. Uh, not anymore now, but they still control the Senate. Um, and now it's the Democrats who have the passion. Um, a lot of people are furious at Trump. Uh, his core supporters will never abandon him, but that's down to the low 30s. So, uh, so I think it's likely, unless the Democrats blow it, if they pick an unlikable person, which is quite possible that they will, mm -hmm. but if they pick somebody who's likable, I think the Democrats are likely to win. Well, and the Democrats seem like they have a hard time finding their message and finding their theme that they can all rally about mm -hmm. around. And it goes to a, a sentence that you had a thought that I really loved in The Righteous Mind when you said the human mind is a story processor, not a logic processor. Yes. And what seems illogical to me is when you've got the left and you've got a more liberal environment, which is the artists and Hollywood and people that, you know, are willing to reach out and try things differently, you would assume they would be better at storytelling. And yes. yet they don't seem to be. And that is something I can't quite figure out. So first, I'd like to start off with this thought about the mind is a story processor, not a logic processor. What do you sure. mean by that? Um, so the mind is a neural network. 
it's very good at seeing patterns. Um, that, that's why our perceptual systems are fantastic. They work instantly and with very little error. We love metaphor in which one pattern is equated to another, and we get it in a moment, in a flash of recognition. Uh, all around the world, cultures educate their kids with stories. There are great myths that can be you know, thousands of or hundreds of pages long if you write them out, uh, and, but they could be recited from memory if they rhymed and if they made sense as stories. Um, so the Iliad and the Odyssey in, in the West, uh, the Mahabharata and, uh, and others in India. Uh, so there's no doubt that human beings love stories. Um, we, we read stories to our kids. Kids learn in stories. It's easy. It's effortless. A trick that I use as a teacher is uh, when I'm trying to explain an experiment or anything, if I can put it into story form, if I can say, once upon a time, you'd psychologists believe X, but you know, there were all these funny results that kept coming up. And then this one heroic person tried something else and here's how he tested it. And you turn it into a story, it's a lot more fun. It's, it's easier to follow, to pay attention. You don't get bored. Whereas if you say, now let's look at this question and let's look logically what would predict what. That, that you know, we can do it, but it's hard. You have to really pay attention uh, to, to do that. So I think if you if you see human nature as as being basically wrapped up in storytelling and story receiving, uh, you can go a long way, and that applies uh, not just in teaching but also in politics. So to pick up on what you were saying about the Democrats' perennial difficulty of telling a story, the 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 great book on that is by Matt Bai. I think that's how you pronounce it, B A I, reporter for the New York Times. Um, so after I think it was after the two thousand defeat of, uh, of of Al Gore maybe it was 2004, John Kerry, I can't remember which. There's a guy, Rob Stein, came up with this PowerPoint talk that he was showing in democratic circles about how the Republicans did it, how they were able to present a, a narrative. And, and that's when the word narrative became a big deal for Democrats. And so the Democrats set out to try to find their narrative. What's, the, what's like the great story? George Lakoff wrote, uh, has written some really excellent books on this. Uh, his book, Moral Politics from the mid-90s, was very important in the development of my thinking about, um, about uh, how left and right think about the world, uh, about the metaphors that we use. Going back earlier, his book, Metaphors We Live By, is the classic. Oh, yeah, I've got that. About, <laughs> that is great. Yeah, that really affected me in grad school. I love that book. So, so uh, Lakoff wrote, Don't Think About an Elephant, uh, a book called Don't Think of an Elephant, I think it was called. And the Democrats all read it. And they said, okay, you know, what, what's our narrative? What's our story? Um, um, and Matt Bai chronicles the, the efforts that the Democrats made in 2005, 2006, 2007. Uh, and he writes it all up in a book called The Argument. And at the end of the book, it's kind of sad because the Democrats never were able to make progress. They, you know, they have the greatest minds uh, in Hollywood, in the Academy, and in Madison Avenue, yet they were never able to come up with a coherent story. And that was in 2007. And now fast forward, you know, Hillary Clinton's campaigning, people kept saying, what is this about? And she could not come up with an answer. So many political scientists have observed uh, that the Democrats are a coalition of interest groups and identity groups. There is no coherent story binding them together. The closest they can come is to say America is a matrix of oppression and, and it's evil. And so we all have to unite against it. Uh, but that kind of alienates a lot of Americans because Amer most Americans are somewhat patriotic. So the Democrats have never been, I shouldn't say never, the Democrats in my lifetime, um, you know, some were more eloquent than others, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama could tell stories, but there was never a grand story on the scale of what Ronald Reagan did for the Republicans. And that was really, and I guess it's still around today, is holding and binding the, the Republican Party together because they are all in it together a little more than the Dems, if the Dems are more of a collection of interest groups. Um, yes, although I wouldn't say it's it, it's holding them together now because no. uh, you know the you know if you're a free market Wall Street type, well I uh, I don't know, you know <laughs> they, they like the tax cuts they're mixed on the trade war stuff generally negative about the trade wars but I, so I don't know what to say but again there's not the coherence Trump is who he is um, he certainly plays on emotions we all have emotions we can't get away from hearing about them and thinking about them but no I, I don't think the Republican coalition is held together in the way that it was. Um, just a few years ago. So now let's move to your most recent book, The Coddling of the American Mind, which really blew me away. Uh, I've seen so much of it in you know, a little bit my household in the work I did at ASU. I taught there for four years. Um, what is happening in our schools and why that seems to be widening this divide even more? 
so there's one fact which is indisputable um, about these rapid changes in generations, which is that rates of anxiety, depression, self-harm, like cutting yourself, um, and suicide are rising rapidly in the generation born after 1995. Uh, I called them iGen in my book, but just in the last few months, it's clear the winning label for that generation is now Gen Z. Um, the millennials were Gen Y, uh, but the current gen- young generation, college students today, high school students today, are Gen Z. Gen Z, but I like your iGen a little bit better because I think it's more descriptive of why they are or how they have become um, who they are through their iPhones and digital devices. That's right. And that's the leading candidate for, for why they're so different. Um, the millennials got, you know, they grew up with um, PCs and, and video games, and they got the internet when they were teenagers, but they didn't get social media until they were in college or afterwards. And it does, so their brains were not harmed by it. Social media, and this is not established, um, but social media connects people in ways that um, lead to chronic social comparison, enables new forms of bullying and aggression, uh, can, leads to constant fear of missing out. Um, adults can take this and it's unpleasant, but it doesn't seem to change their brains. I believe, and I can't prove this yet, but there's a lot of suggestive evidence, that when kids get social media in middle school, when they are 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, and you hook them up in this way, um, that I think it does lasting damage. So think about it like this. Well, first of all, let me be clear. Um, The rates of anxiety and depression begin going up in about 2012. And they go up very rapidly, especially for kids born after 1995. And especially for girls, it's much bigger for girls. The suicide rate for teenage boys is up about 25 to 30%, which actually is from what I mean is um, if you take the rate in 2016 or 2017 and compare it to the rate, the average rate for the first decade of this century, Teenage boys are up about 25 to 30%, which is not out of line with the rest of the country, actually. The suicide rate is rising in this country for most groups. Hmm. Um, it's falling around the world, but it's rising in the United States. As an aside, like, why do you think that is? Um, I don't know. Um, our drug epidemic uh, it, it, it hits some of the populations. Um, income inequality and insecurity. Uh, when hard times come, people in Northern Europe don't have to worry about how they're going to pay the bills or medical bills, but, but Americans do. So I don't know. I, yeah. I need to read up on the theories as to why we're different from the rest of the world. Which you see this increase yeah, in, the, in the younger teenage and, and early 20s population and more in girls than boys. In your book, you talked about um, social media. If they're getting they're finding their stress in social media. Boys will literally take it out on boys and go out and beat someone else up where girls will tend to beat themselves up internally more. Well, let me, let me put it a little differently. So first, just to finish up on the suicide stats, the boys are up, but they're not really out of line. Now the young boys, 10 to 14, they are up much more than other group, mm-hmm. other groups of boys. But the stunning finding is really the girls. Uh, women suicide rates are lower than men, but they have increased more than men in the last uh, 10 years. Um, if you look at girls age 15 to 19, that increases 70%. That is a gigantic increase. And I just found this out a few weeks ago. When you dig into the stats and you look at just girls who are 10 to 14, they have very low rates. Very few young girls kill themselves. But that group is up 150%. Wow. The suicide rate of our, young, of our young teenage girls is up 150%. So something weird and terrible is going on here. And the leading explanation, so Greg Lukianoff and I, Greg is my co-author, Greg and I, we think there are two main factors. Uh, One is that we began massively overprotecting kids in the 1990s. We stopped letting them out. Uh, Before then, kids always had some independence. They were able to have some time outside. They would hang out with their friends. They would get in fights and have to resolve them. Um, Kids need to unfurl their wings slowly, gradually. They need to practice flying. But sometime in the 1990s, just as the crime wave was ending, Just as life was getting so incredibly safe, Americans, uh, and Canadians too, but Americans especially, freaked out about child abduction, so much so um, that we, by the end, by the turn of the millennium, uh, we began to think that if a kid is found outside, if a nine-year-old kid is found playing in a park, um, the parents need to be either arrested or at least visited by Child Protective Services because that is child neglect. How can you let your kid out? What if, what if, what if, what if someone snatches him or molests him? And so just as the crime rate was plummeting and life was getting safer and safer, we freaked out, denied our kids independence. And guess what? 
when you don't let kids learn to fly and then you, they go off to college, they don't know how to fly at college, they start asking for protections in college. That's what started happening in 2014. Um, from out of nowhere on college campuses, we started hearing these demands for trigger warnings, safe spaces, microaggression training, um, demands to stop speakers from speaking, disinvite this person. Uh, and that's what my co-author Greg Lukianoff noticed. He was, the book was his idea um, that where did this come from? Why are students suddenly so afraid of speech and so so desirous of protection from speech? That was uh, the point we took off from. Moving on, let's talk about the untruths. So in your book, The Coddling of the American Mind, you talk about these three untruths that you've kind of touched on here. Can you go through those quickly with us and how they are impacting us? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so my first book, The Happiness Hypothesis, was about 10 ancient ideas and why they're true or whether they're true. Uh, and one of them is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But in the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen an increasing sense that kids are fragile and that if they're exposed to words or ideas or someone says a mean thing, they'll be damaged. Um, uh, we can't have kids being excluded. We can't have them being insulted. We can't have them fighting. Adults have to step in and protect them. And this gets it exactly backwards. Um, so the first great untruth is what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. And if we raise our kids in this way, what we'll do is we're going to have anti-bullying policies, which are necessary. I mean, real bullying that goes on for days and makes a kid not want to come to school. That's a serious problem. I, I, we support um, uh, intelligent anti-bullying policies. But when you get the idea uh, that Kids must be protected from conflict, from insult, from exclusion. Um, you're basically doing the equivalent of protecting them from peanuts. What I mean by that is um, the immune system requires exposure to dirt and germs and, and foods of all sorts in order to tune itself up. And what we did in the 90s, again, was we said, oh my, some kids are allergic to peanuts. We better get peanuts uh, out of schools. We better protect kids from peanuts. And what happens, the rate of peanut allergies triples over the next 10 or 15 years. The cure for peanut allergies is not protecting kids from peanuts. It's actually giving them small doses of peanuts, it turns out. That's the most effective cure for peanut allergies. So like we've really messed up our kids adapt. by overprotecting them, basically. Mm -hmm. Kids are anti-fragile, but if you treat them as though they're fragile, uh, then they will grow up weaker. And that, we think, is one of the main reasons why anxiety and depression is skyrocketing among American kids. And does uh, this British play kids, back your... kids too. Early, earlier point at the top of the show where you talked about um, prosperity, the problems with prosperity yeah. that they, we don't have enough to worry about. So we go and we find things to worry about and we start over protecting our kids mm -hmm. and they just grow up in, in the lap of luxury and, and without um, out there challenging themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. A related phenomenon here is that as societies get more prosperous uh, and as women become more educated and more equal, the birth rate tends to go from anywhere from between four to six in traditional societies, four to eight, whatever it is, down to less than two. And so a lot of families have just one child and very few have more than two. When that happens, you now have two parents and it's great that men are contributing more and men are spending more time with their kids. But amazingly, um, back in the 50s, when uh, families were large and women did not work outside the home, women put in a certain number of hours a week. Now, when families are smaller, there are fewer kids, women are working outside the home. Women are actually spending more time um, doing child rearing stuff than they did uh, when they worked less and had more kids. So, in a sense, we're over investing. We're spending too much time with our kids. We, and it's in part because we completely deny them time unsupervised. We think that if they're unsupervised, they'll burn the house down, they'll stick their finger in a socket if they're home, or if we let them out, they're going to do stupid things like step out in front of traffic. We don't think kids can learn how to cross a street, even though all of us did when we were six or seven. Um, all of us were, you know, if you're born before 1982, you were let out at the age of six or seven, and you could walk down the street and go to a friend's house, and kids would play in someone's yard, and then they'd walk somewhere else. Uh, kids can learn how to cross the street at the age of six or seven. And now we don't let them learn until, you know, we don't let them out until they're between 10 and 14 is what I find. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so we grossly yep. overprotected the kids. The other two are yep. um, always trust your feelings. And uh, this is the foundation of cognitive therapy is that our feelings often lead us astray. Sometimes they pick up things that our conscious mind doesn't, but very often um, they drive our thinking. We, we, um, you see this especially in people who are depressed and anxious. And so if we have a huge increase in the number of depressed and anxious kids on a college campus who can easily take offense at, at many things, 
And no one is entitled to say, well, you know, let's look at it differently. Maybe, you know, maybe you're not right about that. Maybe there's another way to look at it. If you can't say that, you can't invalidate their experience. You have to validate whatever it is that they, what's their reality. Um, you're basically allowing cognitive distortions to spread. Uh, and what we should be promoting is critical thinking, is a, a habit of questioning our automatic reactions, a habit of looking for evidence and challenging each other to find evidence. So we, we, we don't do that as much anymore out of sensitivity to people's lived experience. And this kind of the, third grade the elephant and the writer, the elephant, it seems to be in control. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And universities, we, we should really be training uh, writers a lot better. Yeah. And then the third great untruth is life is a battle between good people and evil people. This is a belief that humans are prone to. We're very good at tribalism, as we said at the beginning of this, of this discussion. Uh, and it's a, it's a real achievement of modern secular societies to turn that down, to get people to stop judging each other as members of groups and treat each other as individuals. That was an enormous accomplishment of the 20th century. It goes back to the 18th century. And now I'd say we're, we're going backwards on that. Um, in many schools, especially more progressive educational contexts, there's a lot of training about intersectionality, about matrices of oppression. Um, I think the, uh, the Covington Catholic affair really revealed that. Um, many people are learning or have learned to judge people based on their race and gender um, and to hate people based on their race and gender. This is the Catholic school in Kentucky where they had the standoff of an eighth grader in front of a, a Native American. That's right. And if, yeah. you have, if you have a white kid in a MAGA hat and a Native American, it's obvious who's good and who's bad. We don't need facts. We know just from looking, uh, you know, white boys are bad, Native Americans are good. At least that's the view in some circles. Um, and so the jumping to conclusions, the making intense moral judgments about people based on the race and gender is a horrible thing. And that's, you know, we got over a lot of that in the 20th century. But I think there's a, a movement in certain circles um, to teach young people um, um, to get them to see society in binary terms. You know, there's a good race and a bad race. There's a good gender and a bad gender. Um, and I, this is terrible. This is a t we, we can't have a multi-ethnic diverse democracy if we're teaching people to judge and think in terms of group versus group. Yeah. So that's what the third great untruth is. Um, in fact, everybody and every group is good and bad. Um, uh, power corrupts, sure, but... Um, uh, that doesn't mean that powerful people and groups are necessarily evil. Um, life is difficult and nuanced, and 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 you, you have to you have to be slower to judge. Um, yeah. You know, Jesus didn't say judge more and don't let anybody tell you. You know, don't let anybody judge you. I mean, that's that's not ancient wisdom. Uh, so, if you put all these together, what you get on some college campuses, it's not most, but on the most progressive ones, the the elite ones in the Northeast and the West Coast, um, um, what you get is a sense, you get students coming in um, who haven't had much independence, who are more fragile, are more anxious and depressed, which means they're more prone to see things in negative terms. They're told to go ahead and keep seeing things in negative terms. Don't let anyone question your lived experience. And then they're told, um, here's how the world works. There are bad groups and good groups. Um, and so if you put this all together, it's a recipe for constant conflict. And a university cannot do its job if people are in this mindset of threat and fear and anger. We cannot learn. We cannot be curious if we're in that mindset. So what Greg and I are doing in the book is we're trying to call attention to this. We're trying to call universities back to their mission of creating an environment. Uh, it's not all about free speech. It's not like, oh, you should be able to say whatever you want whenever you want. But it should be an environment of open inquiry, of curiosity, um, uh, in which we try to give each other the benefit of the doubt, learn from each other, and recognize that we need each other. We need moral and political and ideological diversity so that people will challenge us uh, and ask the difficult questions that we cannot ask ourselves. That's our hope. Um, we're actually finding a lot of people are recognizing just how messed up things are in many universities. And I should note, it's spreading into business very quickly. Um, members of Gen Z who first arrived on college campuses in 2013 just graduated from college in 2017. They're entering the corporate world. And they're bringing some of this hypersensitivity into the corporate world. And, and uh, I hear stories from business leaders about how their young employees will run to HR if they overhear a joke that they don't like. So this is a national issue, a national problem. I don't want to be too harsh on these kids. It's not their fault. The parents didn't let them out. We then gave them social media when they weren't ready for it. We gave them all kinds of newfangled educational uh, initiatives that, that have encouraged them to see uh, people as good versus evil. So it's not their fault. Um, but we've got to stop doing this. 
Mm-hmm. We've got to find ways, if we're going to have a diverse democracy, we've got to find ways to live together, give each other the benefit of the doubt, and sometimes overlook small things. You know, don't assume bad intent. Um, if, we, if we can find ways to live together despite our differences, I think we'll make it through. But if we continue with current patterns, we won't. Well, thank you very much for being here. Fascinating. Uh, love your work. Do you have a new book coming out anytime soon? No, the, the coddling is going to, you know, now that it, the issues that we raised there are clearly spreading to business, mm-hmm. they've spread intensely down into high schools, especially private schools. Um, oh, so let me just, so that's going to occupy me for the next year or two entirely. I'm supposed to be writing a book on capitalism and morality, but these challenges are so urgent. I'm going to spend the next year or two working on them. I would urge anyone who has children under the age of 16 or so to go to letgrow.org. It's an organization founded by Lenore Skenazy of Free Range Kids, and I'm on the board of it. It has all kinds of great ideas for how you can give your kids more freedom, how you can encourage your schools, your, your kids' schools, to do a better job of, of raising independent kids able to function in the world. Um, so there are all kinds of great ideas out there. There are solutions. There are ways that um, we can give childhood back to kids. Uh, and I urge people to go to letgrow.org. And Jonathan, how can people learn more about you and find your new book? Uh, well, just uh, you can go to thecoddling.com is our webpage, or you can just go buy the book, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Oh. Well, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Park. A pleasure talking with you. And thank you all for listening to this edition of The Business of Story. If you liked what you heard today, on any number of levels, from the political side to understanding the moral foundations to what's happening in our schools with Gen Z or the iGen. And you've got a friend, family member, or colleague who you feel would benefit from hearing from Jonathan and reading some of his materials. Please share this episode with them. It's one of my uh, favorite because Jonathan is such a powerful author and a lot of the constructs and insights that I've learned in teaching storytelling, I have gotten directly from him. And that's why I'm so honored to have him here. So please share this episode with someone that you think can benefit from it. And of course, if I can be a service to you, you know where to find me at thebusinessofstory.com. And please come back next Monday when we will have another amazing story artist on like Jonathan Haidt. And until then, remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.